<clears throat> All right. We are recording. So this is the uh, third. I think this is our third. Uh, our third uh, session on uh, the practice of the presence of God, Brother Lawrence. And um, we're using the book that has the foreword um, by Henry Nowen and translated by John Delaney. And so if any of you don't have the book yet, um, you can let me know. I can send you a link. Just make sure you get the, the same one we're using because otherwise the pages won't line up and the translation from the French won't be the same. So it is important on this one we get the same, same edition. Um, we are most of the way through the introduction at this point. So I wanted to just back up um, a couple of paragraphs. So let's start on page 15 tonight. Um, yeah. Start on page 15. So we did read the foreword by Henry Nowen, which was, uh, which was well done. And the introduction has been good. He started with um, a little bit of just the, the, the basics of where he sees the book fitting into kind of the pantheon of Christian spiritual literature. And then he went into a, a little bit about Brother Lawrence's history as a person. And there's so little there that didn't take very long. So he gave us a little background there. He talked about the book and the publication of the book. We only read a part of that. That was just kind of interesting about how the book ended up published. And then he's been talking about the actual content of the book in this last section. And he said he didn't want to spend a lot of time on it um, because um, the book kind of speaks for itself. But, um, but he did try to make a few points. And I want to go ahead and, and just kind of hit those points again so we can see, at least from the translator's point of view, what were the important points for him as, as he's been working and translating this particular work. So starting on page 15, the second full paragraph, he's talking about um, what is important, what's rewarding about this book. And as he says, it seems to me the reason for this, why, for what, that the book has been uh, with us for 300 years and going strong, never been out of print and continues to be read by more and more people. It seems to me the reason for this is essentially threefold. First and foremost is the author's simplicity of style. Brother Lawrence was neither an intellectual nor a literateur. What he had to say, he said simply and forthrightly and with little finesse and often with telling bluntness. So it's just the simplicity of style. And we talked about this last week as being uh, a mirror of the, um, of the desert fathers and mothers, and really of Jesus as well. And most spiritual masters, they're just very simple. They just say what they say, you know, not a lot of highfalutin stuff. Of course, Jesus is a poet, so he's always speaking in metaphor and, and uh, beautiful uh, imagery and, and symbolism, but it's still very simple. And it's always pulled right from everyday life. And Brother Lawrence is going to be exactly the same. When you read him and you read about him in the conversations, then it's all just very, very simple. And so it stands the test of time. It doesn't get dated. You know, it doesn't sound like it's coming from any one time period. It's just the way people talk. Last full paragraph. Second, and as a consequence of this simplicity, is the fact that the author comes through in the writings so that the reader gets to know the man behind the letters, the conversations, and the maxims. Here is a plain, humble, unassuming man beset by the difficulties we all have to endure, struggling to find his way through life, stumbling and falling, but manage always to right himself. So he's just a simple, unassuming man. It matches his, his style, the way that he speaks, but it also is speaking about the man himself. I love this. He's, um, he falls the way the rest of us do, but he always manages to write himself. Really important. There was a song a while back that um, basically said that uh, a sinner is just a saint who fell and got up again. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking... And I've said a lot of times, probably to you all as well, that our spiritual progress is not really measured by how many times we're triggered emotionally to feel something or to feel anything negative. 
or how many times we fail, it's measured by our recovery time. How quickly can we come back to center after we do get triggered? How quickly can we come back to center after we've quote unquote failed that the outcome didn't come out the way that we wanted to? It's that recovery time coming back. As you see that getting shorter and shorter, what used to be weeks or months is now a matter of days or hours. And then when you start to really realize that that recovery time is short, that you can come back to center quicker and quicker, then you start seeing the triggers start to space out fewer and further between and less intensity. But I've noticed that the first measure of any progress is the recovery time. At least it has been for me and some others that I've talked to. But, but uh, just notice that, same thing. He always manages to write himself. He can bring himself back to center. He can keep himself firmly, keep everything firmly before him through all the vicissitudes, the changes in life to the final goal of life, knowing and loving God so that he may be worthy of celestial nice. union with him in eternity. Mm -hmm. And he says, and therein lies the third of my reasons for Brother Lawrence's universal appeal. Here is a man who has found a way to be always in the presence of God. We feel it and we know this is so as we read his words. Without pretension or flourish, he shows us his way and we see it unfold as we read how he has succeeded in acquiring and practicing continually this presence of God. So those are his three reasons that he sees for this 300 year appeal that Brother Lawrence has on us, why we keep coming back to him. That he speaks simply, that the simplicity is a fact of life for him that comes through so that we get to know the man himself and that he is always managing to right himself. He's always managing to come out back to center. And then finally, he's found this way to always be in the presence of God. Then he's going to make some additional points here. Skip down to, um, for Lawrence is the ultimate goal. It's at the uh, third paragraph, complete paragraph. He's going to make some additional points why he thinks this is so simple. This is so important. For Lawrence, the ultimate goal of every soul is union with God. Though he knew the perfect union can take place only after death, he believed we can achieve a far greater degree of unity with God in this life than most people think is possible. And the way to accomplish this is through practicing the presence of God. The second point in this next paragraph, to achieve the presence of God is no easy task. And the path is strewn with numerous pitfalls and constant difficulty. Mm -hmm. Consequently, we must labor constantly and exert every effort at all times to affect this happy state. Huh? Now, does that sound in any way uh, like counterintuitive to you all? We must no. labor constantly and exert every effort at all times to affect a happy state. <laughs> Sounds exhausting. <laughs> yeah. Does it sound like a lot of fun? Constant difficulty, constant pitfalls, constant labor, constant effort in order to get to a happy state. Sounds very Catholic. Well, there's that too, especially medieval Catholicism, right? Um, I have, wait a minute, a whole second. <laughs> um, I, I didn't read that he's saying to get to a happy state. This, he refers to this state, which he defines as happy. But I don't think he means like giddy happy, giggle happy. Do you? Um, uh, I would qualify that. Yes. What? Well, you tell us what you think the happy state is. <laughs> um, I think it's a state that's joyful, um, that's peaceful, um, that's meaningful, that's purposeful. And things like that. <laughs> and I think I think you're right on, Brady. But how does that square with the constant effort and the constant difficulty and the constant pitfalls? Are they compatible? Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, it's it's like. Um, to, to it's like contemplation or meditation or prayer. Um, it, it it really doesn't come naturally. 
Mm-hmm. It just doesn't. Uh, you always said that that um, you know that kind of state of presence or bliss comes uh, through a, a lifelong history of contemplation, meditation, and discipline, or through catastrophe. Well, none of those things are easy. Uh, it's either work, or it's constantly being mindful, or it's fighting off the egoic mind, um, or, or our distractions. Uh, it, you know, there's there's a, at, at a minimum there's a discipline to that. Um, and I, th- I think it's just kind of hard work. And I would absolutely agree. So here, here's the, here's the thing that he's pointing out that if you think that this sounds so good, I mean, just, just constantly practice the presence of God, just constantly keep a conversation going with him, you know, just constantly be aware of God. And it, and it sounds like it, it should be this blissful thing. And he calls it a happy state. Yeah, and that doesn't mean giggly happy, but what it does mean, it means a fortunate state, really, rather than happy in the way we think of happiness. But it's fortunate. It's a it's a fortuitous state to be in, this presence of God. But remember that he spent the first 10 years of his cloistered life fighting to get to a place of a breakthrough that he then enjoyed for the next 50 years. But that first 10 years is very difficult for him. Just like Brady is saying, he had to learn how to do this. And he was fighting everything that you and I fight. You know, sometimes we think about some, someone living in a, in a 17th century French monastery as not having all the distractions and all of the, uh, the noise and, and uh, you know, constant choice and everything else that we've got in the modern world, that it must have somehow been easier for Brother Lawrence to, to pull this off than it would be for us living here in the modern Western world or wherever we live. The truth of the matter is, it's exactly the same for all of us everywhere and every when, because the noise is really in our heads. That's the chief noise that we're trying to to work around. Yes, certain conditions are gonna make it easier because they're quieter and so on and so forth, but that's still, that head, that ego of consciousness is gonna present the same kind of resistance that it does to anybody here or anywhere. And he had to work through that. And so what he's saying is this is the situation. It is going to be difficult. But what I wanted to point out for you is it doesn't stay at the same degree of difficulty all the time. But there is never a moment, if you're practicing the presence of God, that you aren't actually and actively balancing in the moment. In other words, there's never a time where you learn how to do this and then you don't have to put any effort in anymore. Mm-hmm. Every moment is the choice either to be present or not to be present, to push through the distractions or to succumb to the distractions. Every moment is a choice to do that. But after you do it for a certain amount of time, it moves into procedural memory. It moves into muscle memory. It becomes something that you can do without even thinking about it anymore, like anything else that you practice and get good at. And so like a tightrope walker, I like that image the best. The tightrope walker walks across the cable as easily as you and I walk across the room, and it seems so effortless, but there's not a moment that they're not balancing with their pole or whatever they're using to balance, because the second that they stop balancing, they're just a heap on the floor someplace. Same thing with us. If we aren't balancing as we walk across the floor, we're we're a heap, a puddle on the floor. So we're always balancing, but you don't think about walking anymore. It's just all natural. It feels effortless, but you're still balancing every instant that you're upright. And it'll be the same thing with the practice of the presence of God. It will feel so difficult at first. It'll feel almost impossible at first when you just start out, trying to break through all the noise in your mind, trying to corral every thought and 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 just be present. But after a while, you do it as easily as you walk across the floor, but you're still doing it. There's never a point that you can become passive about being mindful, passive about practicing God's presence. It's always an active thing, but it does get easier. And of course, as Brother Lawrence points out, the, re- the, the, the reward of the happy state is so worth the effort that you will put in especially at the outset. Is that helping to resolve some of the dissonance there, I hope? Yes. 
I something that always um, that I consider is that when I first started practicing the presence of God, you know, it was so hard, and then I got into a place where it was it was easier, and it was kind of more flowing. But I feel I find it's almost seasonal. It's like then all of a sudden something else will come along, and like oh my gosh, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> so I'm back here again. So it's like it's like these little steps towards that. Um, and I'm in that state right now. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, remodeling the house, of course. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, see, that's what it does. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, so I sometimes think about my, my thoughts like uh, vampires or zombies or something. It's like, no matter how many of them you get gone, there's always more coming. And there's some <laughs> no. of them that you, you're sure that you put a stake through the heart of that one a long time ago. And here it is again, right in yeah. the center of your brain i mean it's 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 exactly like you're describing rosemary you know mm -hmm. we we go through we're human beings we're going to go through times where external pressures crowd on and suddenly that balance that we had so carefully cultivated is just out the window again yeah. and then we need to stop but the the, the good news there is we have more tools now we yeah know how to do it and we know what it feels like so we can return to that sensation of what it feels like when you move to that centered place. And so again, it's about the recovery time. Mm -hmm. It's not about what derails you. It's can you come back to center again? And sometimes it's gonna be easier than others. And mm -hmm. you know, when the big traumas of life hit, well then, yeah, we're, we're basically kind of cast to the wind again and we need to regroup and put it all back together again, but it's gonna be different. Because when the traumas hit, that changes the nature of our reality. That loss that, that may not come back is going to change the nature of our reality. And so our practice of presence of God has to incorporate that new reality as well, which is mm -hmm. going to change the nature of it. Mm -hmm. But we can do it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that, that experience is, thank you for, for pointing that out. So it's not a linear process. Mm -hmm. Put it that way. Coming back to this thought of labor um, to get to and stay in that place of happiness, I had two thoughts. One of them was recycling one of your ideas, Dave, that, uh, you know, it takes no effort for my room to get messy. <laughs> you know, but it entropy, takes... Entropy, entropy. <laughs> right. But it takes effort to keep it clean, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it's that, it's that kind of work. And uh, the second thought I had on that was um, this book, Happiness is a Serious Problem. Um, they, I forgot who wrote it, but he talks is that, about... Uh, is that Dennis Prager? Yes, yes. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Um, Damn it. I, <laughs> it went away. <laughs> the thought went, sorry. <laughs> but, um, the, he was talking about, he said, we have, a, we have an obligation to, no, here's the thought. Um, he, he considers it lazy to be angry. Like mm. it takes no effort to be angry. It takes discipline to be happy because there are always reasons to be angry. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 So, so there's, there's kind of an interior mental entropy, you know, everything is going to go from uh, order to disorder, always in that direction, never the other way. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's real easy to let our thoughts be diffused and scattered it's real easy to just give in to the triggers of our emotions. But if we're going to pull back to a centered place, that's going to take energy. We're going to have to put in energy in order to create that silence and solitude and stillness. So good. That's, that's another great visual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really important that as, we, as we're looking at this practice of presence, that we get as much of a sense of what it is with as many either metaphors or analogies or sensations that we can use to be creating, recreating when we're trying to do this ourselves, because it's a, it's a slippery thing, you know, when you're first starting out. So hopefully this is putting a little bit more skin on the bones here of what we're talking about.
Okay, let's read a little bit more. He said, well, we said to, to achieve the presence of God is no easy task. The path is strewn with numerous pitfalls and constant difficulties. To do so, two things are essential. Next paragraph. The first of these is to abandon oneself completely to God. Over and over again in his letters and conversations, he stresses the importance of complete trust and confidence in God's goodness and mercy. We must trust God once and for all and abandon ourselves to him alone. It is necessary to put our complete trust in God. We should surrender ourselves in things temporal and in things spiritual, entirely and with complete abandonment to God. We have a God of infinite goodness who knows what we need and are just a sampling and are and are just a sampling of the exhortations running throughout the entire week. I kind of messed that up. These are a series of quotes from him. Um, and they're just a sampling of the exhortations running throughout the entire work. And this is where we stopped last week. And we spent a lot of time talking about whether or not we actually trust God and what it means to trust. And the sum of all of that that I came to was that trust and anxiety or stress are inversely proportional. As one goes up, the other goes down. And so we can measure our trust level by looking at our stress and anxiety level. If our stress and anxiety are high about any one person or any one circumstance or event, um, then we can say that we don't trust in that or we don't trust ourselves in that. Because when you finally trust something, you stop worrying about it. You stop thinking about it. And if you say you trust God, but your life is characterized by anxiety and fear, well, then you have to rethink whether you really do. It's not that we don't have times of stress and anxiety and depression and anger. That's exactly what humans are heir to. But it shouldn't characterize us. If we really have come to a place of trust with God. So that's kind of the nutshell idea of what we were trying to understand this. You know, again, put a finer point on this idea of trust. It's not just a word out there that we can throw around. It's got to have a real grounded significance. There has to be some way that we can measure it in our lives. Otherwise, we're just kind of spinning and, and using semantics. We really want to have what we talk about here, have a one-to-one -one correspondence with our daily experience. Okay, let's strike out into some new territory now, still on page 17. Along with this total abandonment must go a complete acceptance of God's will with equanimity and resignation. No matter what troubles and ills come our way, they are to be willingly and indeed joyously endured since they come from God and God knows what he is doing. Does anybody have a problem with that paragraph? <laughs> I just Thank you. I have a problem with that. <laughs> okay. Well, you do you want to express your problem? Uh, uh, well, back. To, I think you have, you were you know jump in as as well. I think you were with me there. Um, are we to then think that is this a causal kind of thing he's talking about here? That God will bring troubles or illness or, you know, uh, Lord knows what, you know, these horrible events in our life. Is that what he's saying? It sure seems to be what he's saying. So yeah. then does that require that uh, your individual understanding and relationship with God is that God's will decides that it's a God that literally creates all ills versus a God that just walks beside you mm -hmm. in an earth that has lots of ills. <laughs> you know, it seems like it's, it's pulling for a certain kind of belief in God. Right. Right. And this is going to be one of the problems. And, and someone, I think John said it a while back. Um, you know, that that he was making a joke that that's a Catholic point of view. <laughs> but but it actually sort of is, you know, and especially 300 years ago in in uh, in Europe, 
there was the this i this idea that we needed to suffer in in order to be close to to christ it, the, the more that we physically suffered wore his stripes that's why there was self-flagellation people whipping themselves and and wearing uncomfortable clothes and everything to keep themselves in a state of pain and discomfort was somehow bringing them closer to uh, Jesus suffering on the cross. And of course, there's this idea that everything, that God's sovereignty was such, so complete, God had no opposite, no opposition. He could do everything he wanted to the extent that everything that happened was part of God's will. And so when some evil befell you, somehow that was God's will, just because it happened. This is exactly mirroring the ancient Jews and how they felt about God's sovereignty as well. So it's kind of an idiomatic expression in a way, kind of a, a, an idiomatic way of speaking to always put God in the seat of the actor. All right. So if something happens, it's because God willed it. Uh, the same thing that we do with salvation, whether you make it to heaven or whether you end up going to hell, God wills that. But really, in terms of if you look at Jesus' teaching, God has already acted and given us everything that there is to have. The only open end of the equation anymore is us. We are now the actor. Many are called, but few are chosen. Well, really, it's many are called, but few choose to be chosen because we are the ones that now need to respond. And I think it's the same thing here. Although he's phrasing it, as if the ill comes from you, it's because God knows what he's doing and he put that in your path and you need to just accept it and be joyful about it. Uh, that may be what he literally thought according to his doctrine, or it may be an idiomatic way of thinking. But I want us to be able to have the opinion or the option to take it out of there. Do you remember the phrase, God will never give you more than you can bear? Ugh. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Becky, because it's the exact Sorry. it's the exact reaction I have to that. Now mm -hmm. that is a little bumper sticker saying that is really distilled out of 1 Corinthians 10 13, which is a longer phrase by Paul. But what does Paul actually say in 1 Corinthians 10 13? What he says was that all the temptations and all the ills and tests and trials that you will experience in life are only what are common to mankind. All right. God isn't giving it to you. He's not doing it to you for any kind of purpose. It's only what happens as you're living and breathing here in this physical space. But God is faithful, right? And will not tempt you beyond your power to bear it. But with the temptation will always come the escape. So that's the full thing. That is a very different statement than God won't give you more than you can bear. What it's actually saying is, what you are being given, the, the difficulties that you and the challenges that you have to deal with are just what comes from breathing here in our skin suits. But God is faithful, so you're never going to be without the means to be able to bear the temptation, the trial, or the tribulation, because with it always comes the means of escape. What's the means of, of escape? Well, it's God's presence in the moment. It's God's presence right here and now in the moment of difficulty. So our natural reaction when we hit something that's painful is to back off. But as soon as we do that, we take us ourselves out of the only means of escape, which is to lean into the presence of God, even in difficult circumstances. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that I do not believe that anything bad comes from God. God is love. God is goodness. God is forgiveness and salvation and healing and restoration. That's what God is. He can't be anything else. He's that all the way right down to the table of the elements. And so when you are approaching God, you're approaching that goodness. We can stand in the shade of that sunshine if we want to, but we can't get anything bad from God. And so when we approach God, even in the difficult moments, we are finding our means of escape. We're finding the way through. We're finding the healing. We're finding the presence. As Brother Lawrence said, and I keep quoting because it's such a striking statement, that even if I found myself in hell, mm -hmm. that hell would be transformed into a paradise by the presence of my God. So even in hell, Brother Lawrence is saying, as long as I lean into God's presence, practice presence, even there in the most difficult of imaginable states, I will still find the
the way through because my God's presence will be there. That, I think, is the sense of this. And remember, God's will is not a bulldozer. It's not, it's not this, this, uh, this juggernaut that just runs through and levels everything in its path. God's will, the sebiana, that, Amer that Aramaic word, which means delight and desire and true purpose, deepest purpose, and all of those things, it's, it is the desire of God, the delight of God, what, what uh, gives pleasure to God. That is his sebiana. So to follow God's will is really to make what God finds pleasurable, pleasurable to you. So this whole thing is not a restrictive thing. When we, when we submit to God's will, it's actually freedom because we are aligning ourselves and taking pleasure in the same thing God does. All right. Allison, did you have your hand up? You're muted, dear. Can you, I'm sorry, can you spell that, what you were just saying, that the actual word for God's will is? Or can you? Sebiana? Yes. Uh, okay. It would transliterate as S E B. Mm -hmm. Y-A-N-A. -A. Okay. Sibyana. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to add, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Dave. I was just going to say, it's such a beautiful way to look at God's will. It just turns everything on its head. We think of God's will as something restrictive, something that we don't want to do, something that's going to be going to take all the pleasure out of life, but we're just going to grin and bear it and do it because we'll get a reward on the other side of this life. But it's the exact opposite. It's what would bring us absolute fullness and abundance and pleasure right here and right now, as long as we're seeing life the same way that God does, so that we're taking pleasure in the same things that God does, and then everything is transformed. Now we're into the law of liberty that uh, James talks about in his book. It, it, just, it just takes everything and turns it around. It, it was just one of those fundamental concepts that just turned light bulbs on for me, and I'm hoping it will for you too. Okay, Ellen, go. Yeah, so I'm in the middle of reading this <clears throat> book called The Language of God by uh, Francis Collins. So in one of the chapters, he talked about two thoughts about our perception of God. Uh, one is called theist, T-H-E-I-S-T. One is deist, D as in David, E-I-S-T. So, and I get mixed up which is which. Okay, so one is God created God intervenes in our lives. God gives and God takes away and, and there's consequences. The other one says, God created, this is it. It's the presence of God. He doesn't intervene. It's us who does things. It's us who makes decisions. It's us who does. And it's like, like more like a hands-off. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's exactly what you're saying. Um how we do things it is there but it's up to us to take action or choose how to perceive or choose how to cope or endure mm -hmm. that's how mm -hmm. i interpret it okay and then the other thing about surrender total surrender so i was listening to this podcast this morning on the way to work uh, it's called the doctor's art so they were interviewing this icu nurse and she's saying, so 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 it's an analogy to to total surrender. So somebody's intubated. So you, you know you're 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 fighting it. So they they bound you. They <laughs> they actually um restrain your arms so you so you so you don't pull it until she said to the patient, she says, sweetie, you are safe. It's okay, you are safe. And then she can see the heart rate goes down, the calmness comes. So that to me is surrender. This is your life, but you have to trust the process. So when you say something about having it concrete, to me, that hit me in a very concrete way. Mm -hmm. When you are in a helpless state, you just say, you let it go. I, I trust the process. I will be okay. That's hard. That's a perfect analogy, though. I love that. Yeah. Did you all guys get that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. The moment mm -hmm. that you realize, hey, this is for my good. This is survivable. You know, right. it, it feels like I'm going to be suffocated or I'm going to be, you know, strangled. But but uh, then you can relax into it. It's exactly the same thing. That, that, and that's that's perfect. Brilliant way yeah. of looking at it. But and I can put my be the feeling of it. You're yeah. fighting, fighting, fighting because you are fighting Very. so hard to hold on to your own sense of self. Everything that you have built up and everything that you rely on and hang on, and it feels like life. It feels like oxygen. 
And then when you finally realize you can let this go and everything continues and actually changes for your better, then you can relax into it and your heart rate can drop. So that that's that's a, that's a really great analogy. Yeah. Well, that's scary. I, I can put myself in that position. I, I'd be scared. I'll be striving <laughs> to say, let me breathe on my own. <laughs> I did, want, I did want to, just before, before, just hold that thought, Kathy. You can do that, right? Better than William? <laughs> I'm holding. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make a clarification about theism and deism, though, oh. because cause, um, they're, they're, they're not necessarily hard and fast, um, you know, uh, binary choices. Uh, deism is kind of like the absentee landlord sort of idea that God uh, created the universe, wound it up, and now he's somewhere in Barbados having, um, you know, a, a drink on the beach. And, and the rest of us are just trying to deal with what we got to deal with here on this life. Theism is the idea that God is somehow knowable as a personality, and we can interact with this God. But I am a theist. I'm not a deist. But I still believe that it the action is our job now at this point. That But God is still present. He's still with us. But he's, I don't necessarily see him as orchestrating everything and pulling the strings behind the, the scenes like the master puppeteer that, that, um, that world systems and the universe runs kind of on its own steam to a certain degree, but that God's presence is still right here and right now. Uh, Brother Lawrence would not be a deist because he believes that you can interact with God's presence all day long in every moment of your day. But... I would still say yes, but the choices are ours at this point. God has already made all his choices in our favor. Now it's just up to us to choose him back. And so it's kind of a midway point between the two, between theism and deism, I guess, is the way I would see it. Okay, Kathy. Oh, oh, we go R real quick, Scott, on that point. Yeah. Go ahead. Just real quickly, the scripture that says, God, I'm having a William moment. The scripture just went on my brain. We'll revisit it in a second. Go on, Kathy. Okay. Well, I was just thinking about what Ellen was just saying and um, thinking about, you know, what about, you know, uncontrollable situations, obviously, like war-torn victims and whatnot, that things are happening that are purely out of your control. I would assume that, you know, as we surrender, death has to be one of those options that we're surrendering to as mm -hmm. well. It must be. Because if there's no other mm. option for survival or you're doing everything you can and it's out of your control, so, you know, and we're always talking about people that are dying, you know, let go, let go. But if someone is, that, that has to be an option that someone has to face, I guess, as a connection to God, too, just to carry you forward through the death. Right. Yeah. I guess. The last big surrender. The last final surrender, really. Mm -hmm. I would submit that um, with, you know, not to disregard what Kathy just said, very eloquent, Kathy. Um, I believe that uh, the the issues that that are being that are are being with in which we are being uh, placed. And the things that we're experiencing in life, once we experience it and we learn from them, that our lives are, are infinitely better, higher quality. And I think that I think that my personal feeling is that God has put put us put those situations in our in our path, uh, from which we are we can learn and grow. And um, I think that's I think that's part of what what Brother Lawrence was saying. Abandon yourself completely to God as you understand God. And that's the way I look at it. And um, um, in, in in times of in times of good and plenty, and and also in times of difficult difficulty, um, there's there's much growth to be. I believe that there's much growth to to be experienced and to and to be gained. Result, and I, I would totally agree with you, John. You know, the, the the problem with for me, and maybe not for you. I mean, if if that viewpoint works for you in all circumstances, that's wonderful. But it's kind of a question of degree. If I don't get the parking space I want, then you know, God may be teaching me something, you know, about patience or or uh, or whatever. But if my child dies, drowns in a pool. Um, <laughs> 
how do I take that if I believe that God did that? If God is responsible for everything that comes into my life, good, bad, or ugly, and something of that kind of level of trauma occurs, how do I square that? Can I square that? If you can, you're, I guess, a better man than I am, Gunga Din, because it, it's that was a real difficult one for me. Sure. And so I have taken the other side to say, well, only good things come from God, but the, the world is engineered in such a way that that stuff happens. And then we can extract meaning from it. In fact, that's the way we heal through the traumas of life. We have to reconstruct meaning and we have to recreate how that meaning works and recreate the narrative of, of our identity and everything else. And when we do that, we grow and we're able to expand and take in more of life. But for yeah, me I to think that God was the initiator of those things is a difficult one for me mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it, I don't think that that I'm not I'm not uh, purporting to say that um, that it's going to make us happy, but um, when what you were saying, David, was um, um, it reminded me of uh, Eric Clapton's song about his son, mm -hmm. uh, "Tears in Heaven," uh, mm -hmm. a song that touched me very deeply. Mm -hmm. I've never lost a son, praise God, um, but. Um, that song talked about that that very thing. I don't know. I think you know what song I'm talking about. Of course, of course. And and you know these things can't be proven one way or another. The, this is what each one of us is going to have to develop in our own personal theology. What do we believe about our relationship with God and God's relationship with us about the way the world works and 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 the meaning and the purpose of it all and our identity in it all? That's something that cannot be abdicated to anybody else. Every one of us is going to have to walk down that path and put together our own paradigm so that we can do those two things we're always talking about, accept life on life's terms and live with a sense of hope and gratitude. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then we're, whenever we do that and we think we're successfully doing it, kind of like back to uh, uh, what, uh, who was saying that? Was that Kathy? That we are, we're only one trauma away, away from having to rethink it and, and do it all <laughs> over again. Oh, that was Rosemary. That's Rosemary. Yeah, we're only one trauma away from having to do it all over again, you know, because that there's seasons that come in and take us back out of alignment, and then we have to work through it. That's the healing process, the grieving process. After every bereavement, you know, we're going to have to redo that. So, um, so that's up to us. So, anything that I'm telling you along those lines, those that's what I'm convinced of, you know. But it's not prescriptive. You need to become convinced of what you're convinced of. Okay. Can I put one more thing to us? Well, of course. Yeah, I don't want to monopolize, but uh, I was listening to this other guy that, that's being interviewed. It's my the podcast. He's saying too, yes, we have traumatic events, very painful events, but it's not, and, and then, yeah, people will say, oh, but there's a purpose in that. It's not, what he's saying, it's not that God put that event in your life and there's a purpose. That is a very traumatic event. That's very difficult to say, oh, God did that with a purpose for me. There's some meaning for it. The traumatic event happened. We don't know why. But he says the purpose you find or the meaning you find is what you do after that. And I think that's a very important lesson for me. If, you know, with trauma we have in our lives, it's what we do afterwards that gives meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. Which reminds me of um, Viktor Frankl's mm -hmm. um, book. Man, search for meaning. Right. It's what you do with a circumstance. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. the circumstance. But that's also difficult. Which then begs the question, is there meaning in the events of life intrinsically or is it up to us to search out meaning for ourselves in the events that we experience? Yeah. These I, are all real basic questions that, that are, are good to kick around, at least for yourself, um, because uh, we, we do need to create the meaning. I don't know if the meaning is there and we're just trying to discover it, or if there is no meaning intrinsically in the circumstances, but it's up to us to find it for ourselves. And uh, I don't know that maybe, I don't know, do you need to know the answer to that question? Maybe the, the operation and the process is the same. But, uh, <laughs> these are the things that pop up in my head, and sometimes they spill out all over you. I'm sorry. What can I tell you? <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, let's read a little bit more. He's actually, I'm sorry, Beth, he's going to double down on what he said in the last paragraph. Oh, dear. <laughs> he said, 
This trust must be unreserved with no thought of reward. But inevitably, God will reward the person who so believes and endures with graces and treasures far beyond any sacrifices or offerings he or she has made since he is infinitely good. Also, God never tests us beyond our ability to endure, and as a matter of fact, bestows on us graces that will enable us to endure as we show our acceptance of whatever he sends our way. So there he is paraphrasing 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and uh, he gets the, he's, he's actually got the pieces there. It's just the way that it sounds is that God is the doer of these horrible things, but he's also bestowing on us graces and, and will enable us to endure um, as we show our acceptance of whatever he sends our way. There is a sense of performance-based thinking going on in this paragraph that I also wanted to kind of point out. If we do the things that we're supposed to do, if we have, if we're unreserved with no thought of reward, then God will reward us. There's kind of that if-then sort of thing. I would say that the surrender is the reward itself. It's not that we're waiting for God to reward us as, as if he's withholding something. And then when we perform, then he will let it flow. But that the reward is always and already there. It's only through the surrender through the flowing with God's will, his sebyana, that we actually experience it. And so really, again, we are the actors. This is the way I look at it. You know, you look at it the way you want to look at it, but hopefully whatever you come up with will allow you again to accept life on life's terms and still live with hope and gratitude, even in the difficult times. Simultaneously with this abandonment to God is the constant conversation we should carry on with him on all matters, however great or small, and in all conditions. By continual conversation, we are able to invoke God's presence with us at all times. It is not easy to develop this habit of continual conversation with God, but we must preserve and suddenly, I'm sorry, we must persevere and suddenly one day we will succeed. This conversation must be carried on not only at times formally set aside for prayer, but in the midst of all our activities, however menial they might be. Indeed, as his spiritual life advanced, Lawrence found formal times for prayer appealed to him less than his constant appeals to God, regardless of what task he was performing. And so as I read this, that what comes to my mind is this an actual conversation. In other words, is he forming words either audibly, actually speaking to him, to God and speaking to himself, or is he thinking constantly to himself? Um, many of the early Christians did this at the outset of their spiritual formation. There was the idea of the Jesus prayer, you know, um, Lord have mercy, Kyrie eleison in Greek. Um, and they would say this hundreds of times until they said the prayer was saying them. In other words, that constant prayer, that constant reminder of God's presence through the prayer, through the conversation, finally became internalized, again, into that procedural or muscle memory, so that they didn't need to say it anymore. So I think, once again, the, the final outcome of all of this is going to be silence and stillness and simplicity. So even if this was a conversation, an actual thought, spoken, worded conversation, eventually you would get to the point where that just becomes internalized. It becomes awareness without thinking about it and awareness certainly without speaking about it. That would be at least my take on it all. Can I, can I offer one thing? Absolutely. Uh, you've spoken of, and we've spoken at different times about uh, talking about the soul or the true self or whatever you want to name it. Um, but that, um, to speak of it as the observer, mm -hmm. I think one way to be in constant prayer is to be an observer with an other observer. In other words, to try and develop aware, an awareness of God's eyes on us at all times. God's eyes on our thoughts, God's eyes on our actions, God's eyes on our feelings, um, to, 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 to try and develop that awareness, that way of getting through life. That's brilliant. That's perfect. 
I think that's you're putting your finger right on what this is like. In fact, for those of us who who went through the the tail end of Richard Rohr's book, um, uh, Falling Upward, remember he was talking about mirroring, mm -hmm. all that about mirroring that God is the ultimate mirror. That's mm -hmm. what Brady is actually talking about. That awareness of the awareness, the the observer observing the observer, that mirroring back and forth, um, and and a perfect reflection. It's not colored by any projections. It's not colored by any fears or, or internal programs. It's just a perfect mirroring that two mirrors held face to face, right? Reflecting each other. That's that kind of uh, connection that we're talking about. And I, I think that is that still uh, in concert with what you were saying, Brady? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That idea of mirroring that was so central to the, the back end of, of Richard Rohr's book. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Did I cut somebody else off? Anyone? Okay. And then this last bit on, on page 17. Above all, the way to God is by faith. All things are possible to him who believes, declares Lawrence. And a bit later on, after discussing ways of adoring God, he concludes, all these acts of adoration should be made by faith. It is this faith that enables us to live up to Lawrence's admonition that in justice, we owe him all our thoughts, our words, and our actions. And I think here, it's really important for us to remember the definition of biblical faith, because we as Westerners are going to think about faith as an idea in our mind that we agree with. We mentally agree with an idea, a concept, or a premise and that belief is what we mean by faith. When we talk about our faith, we're talking about our, our, our beliefs, you know, our conceptions. But biblical faith is really action with uncertainty, all right? Which is kind of another uh, uh, definition of trust, if you will, you know? Trust is the ability to not be anxious even in the presence of uncertainty. Faith is the ability to act in the presence of doubt. So the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. As soon as you think you're certain about something, mentally certain, then you've left the realm of faith. Faith is action in the presence of the doubt and the uncertainty. And it still works with what he's saying here. Above all, the way to God is by faith. We need to act as if something is true in our lives. James says a faith without works is dead. If we're not doing something, if we're not acting in relationship with each other, then there is no faith. If we're not risking, if we're not becoming vulnerable so that we can become connectable to each other and risking getting hurt, then there is no faith. And the only way that we can approach relationship with God or anybody else is through that vulnerability to risk something even when we're uncertain if it's going to come back to us. And all these acts of adoration should be made by faith. It's just allowing yourself to be hurtable, vulnerable, open, acting as if it's true. So we need to take faith out of the passive category that we can just agree to something mentally and then sit back and wait for rewards. But rather, we're actually putting ourselves into even think of it as putting yourself into harm's way. When you put yourself into relationship, when you really allow somebody in, you're putting yourself into harm's way. Now, obviously, it's a good trade to be in relationship and to be connected, right? But it's still making you vulnerable. That is this way of faith. That's what he's talking about here. Repeatedly, he stresses the difficulties for those who attempt to follow his practice of the presence of God. But the rewards are beyond our wildest imagination for it, by the uh, wildest imagination. For by it, the soul comes to a knowledge of God that surpasses all other human experiences. Always down to earth and realistic, though. Brother Lawrence is aware that few persons attain this state. It is a grace which God grants only to certain chosen souls, since this simple gaze, the interior gaze by which the soul comes to know God, is a gift freely bestowed by him. There is what I would consider more of that idiomatic way of speaking, right? right. God is right. only going to give it to those that he mm. designs, 
Well, no, it's really more that it's available to everyone, but only certain people are going to be willing to walk by faith. Only certain people are going to be willing to be vulnerable enough to descend all the way down to the bottom of that dog top pile. Let go of everything that you're clinging to for your security, survival, in order to find out what's really real. So once again, it's just a, the, the turn of the phrase. But the truth of the matter is, yes, few persons are going to ever attain the kind of state that Brother Lawrence was in. You know, But it's possible. Now, he was in a, a certain type of person born into a certain kind of state at a certain time in history. And, you know, is that repeatable now? Would Brother Lawrence be Brother Lawrence if he grew up in Orange County, California in 1995? I don't know. <laughs> but we're just talking about ourselves now. And so he continues on. He says, for these few, the experience is sublime. But even those who do not attain this favored state will benefit from striving for it. In closing his maxims, Brother Lawrence puts it this way. He, God, usually gives it to souls which are disposed in that direction. And if he does not give it, one can at least, with the help of his ordinary graces, acquire by the practice of the presence of God a way and a state of prayer which very closely approaches this simple gaze. So he's saying, even if you can't get to whatever pinnacle you might imagine of this uh, practice of presence, practicing the presence in and of itself will take you further than you could probably imagine and take you close to what we have been calling the Anavim spirit, right? The simple, lowly, humble state of complete reliance on a power greater than ourselves. We no longer look to ourselves to supply all our needs, but we look to that power greater than ourselves. And we are comfortable in our dependence. We're comfortable in this vulnerability, this fearless vulnerability. In short, the practice of the presence of God can benefit all souls, wherever they may be on the path to perfection and in their quest for union with God. It is a practice that can benefit anyone who undertakes it. All right. We did it. The intro is done. Not bad. Hey, real quick, I wanted to interject. When I envision God providing all my needs, it is not just the needs that are easily seen to the eye, the exteriorly. I believe God is supplying my inner needs. So my need to understand that there is some safety, some certainty, something that's going on that's not totally random chaos, confusion. Um, there is some the need to feel significant. Um, those types of inner needs that I believe all humans carry with them. Um, having a relationship with God provides all of those needs. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, you know, let's face it. If we're looking to God to provide all our material needs, we could be waiting a long time. You know, we can't all be as rich as Elon Musk. You know, we can't all have the fame of name your local celebrity. That, mm -hmm. that may not happen. But the interior needs, the real things that are going to fill us with the meaning and purpose that we think we might get from the riches of Elon Musk or the fame of a movie star can and will be supplied by God if we are willing to simply divest ourselves of all the things that are blocking us from that reality, from that truth. That's, that's the operative piece. Are we willing to take that plunge? Are we willing to let go? Are we willing to surrender? And uh, in the way that, that Ellen described it, it's a pretty good image of what that's going to feel like, you know, that panic at first until you finally realize, oh, I can still breathe. Okay. And then you can relax and your heart rate goes down. That's a great image, Ellen. Love it. But that, yeah, Randy, that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Any last comments? Short ones? Uh, I, I go. Yeah, I know it's late, um, but... I got hung up on page 17 on the last paragraph, and I know you were kind of explaining it, but because my brain was hung up on it, the thing that 
I don't, I don't it, it, he says all things are possible to him who believes. I get so hung up on that because that you even just that statement, it makes my head go like, well, what am I supposed to be believing, right? Because I, I, like, what do you mean? And I think later on you were talking about like faith, which is being in action, like, you know, all the things. But I, I really got hung up on this little sentence. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't understand. I, I'm like, what is that supposed okay. to mean? Yeah. I'm so glad you brought this up. Okay. Whenever you run across the word that is translated as belief or believe in, in the Bible, it's going to be either a Greek word or it's going to be an Aramaic word. And both of the words that are translated believe or faith in the New Testament mean both belief, faith, and trust all at the same time. And really, what you have in those three meanings to this word is a process. Belief is the idea. Faith is the action that you take because of the idea. And trust is the experience that you will get when you act as if something is true. So it's a process, it's like a three-step process, all contained in one word, one shortcut. And so this idea of belief is not just agreeing to a, a concept. When you say, I don't know what to believe, we're thinking of it just in that first sense, just a, just a, 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 a concept that we mentally assent to, agree to in our head. That's not it. The, the idea that you have is just the, the, uh, the bit that allows you to start to act as if that concept is true. And when you find out that it is, then you develop the trust in it experientially. The goal and the end result of belief is always trust, to get to the place where the heart rate drops, right? Where you stop fighting and they can untie your arms and legs on the gurney. That's the place we want to get to. So it is a process. It's not just believing hard enough in something because we'll never know when that time is and we'll just exhaust ourselves. It's actually moving through the faith walk that gives us the experience that leads to a conviction of something. That is what we believe, that we're convinced of in that sense. So it is the actual action of moving through this process that we're talking about and not just believing in something mentally. Does that help at all? It does. It does actually almost uh, pretty, oh my gosh, it's almost emotionally, oh my gosh. Wow, I didn't know it was this emotional. I think it's because, like, growing up and going to church, like, just seeing that statement, everybody's like, well, if you believe, like, that's all you have to do. Like, you just have to believe. And I'm like, believe in what? <laughs> like, what are we believing in? They're like, oh, well, you know, X, Y, Z, and it has it, whatever they're has been communicated to believe in and I'm like am I an idiot <laughs> like this is not that's really how I felt I think throughout my whole life like I just don't like what I believe and I feel didn't connect with the messages that were like portrayed and I think it almost like oh my gosh it's really emotional I don't know why I think it almost created like this less than feeling like I don't get it and all these other people understand because what resonated with me was not what was communicated. And so anyways, yeah, I think that um, with the way you've explained it, I just think it resonates deeply with like how I feel. And then it also doesn't make me feel like I'm like less than that. I don't understand what these everyone's talking about, you know, like, I, yeah. So Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, I had the exact same experience as I first hit the evangelical church 30 some years ago. And as I look back, it was probably the cruelest thing that anyone did to me in the church was to put that kind of pressure on me in terms of having to believe something and just have enough faith, brother. And then these bad things won't happen to you. And then the bad things happen. Well, you just don't have enough faith. You got to pray more. And it was just like, I'm on a hamster wheel and I could never get off. And it was just so, so maddening. And yes, I felt like I was the dumbest guy in the room. Why couldn't I get it? And what was this secret that everybody knew that that I didn't? 
And so I understand completely, but it doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to, it has to do with actually living out what you think might be true in uncertain uncertainty and doubt and find out what becomes trustworthy and let that thing, and God will always be trustworthy, you know? So if we are allow ourselves to be vulnerable and walk through it, then we're going to get to the other side and then we'll know what we're convinced of. So it's, it's that process. Very different. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yes. I want to say too, with Allison, with her questions and issues, I just want to say too, I'm glad we have this forum. I I can ask questions. I mean, I have the other church. I cannot answer those questions because they are say, yes, you have to have faith. Pray about it. Well, I do. I pray. I pray. But you're <laughs> not answering the questions. So I'm sure they don't have the answers. <laughs> but the posing of it was already like there's a barrier already it's like pray about it no that's not right or something but mm. <laughs> that's why we're here that's why i'm here mm. and i'm you. glad for this place yeah. oh, all right and okay we well, better okay i'm sorry go, real quick, just, Jerry, real go quick. i want to thank allison for bringing it up because i was having trouble with it too mm -hmm. until you explained and for me trust is the goal mm -hmm. you know if i want to get to that place of total trust and then i will do even better in the presence of god because i will totally trust that he's there you mm -hmm. know and that you know allison you really helped me too i was like what <laughs> all i have to do is have faith so <laughs> thanks That's and see great. we're going to see this in spades even in next week when we do the first conversation we're going to be seeing this absolute trust of brother lawrence that's what's going to come to the fore and then when you realize when you get to that place of trust, that's when everything has has flipped over and changed and yep. your experience will be completely different. But that's but this whole process of practicing the presence of God is what gets us to the trust. And it's all a faith walk. It's all that stepping out into the unknown and the, and the doubt and seeing what happens. You know? yep. All right. We better let everybody go to bed now. So um, where did he go? Scotty? Mm -hmm. Right here, ready to there go. He is. He's right in the middle. Go for it, Scott. Thanks for sharing, everybody. It was a really great session. Yeah. Father, we just want to take a moment to acknowledge your presence in our conversation tonight. Here we are reading the practice of the presence of God. So let's practice and do it right. Thank you, Lord, for being here. Wherever we are, whatever we're going through, whatever our needs are, whatever our concerns, our worries, our fears, our celebrations, our joys, and our happiness, your presence in all, in all these things. And that somehow gives us confidence and peace to overcome things that we don't understand and to keep going and look for the answers. Never give up. And you are all the answers we need, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your abundance of love and care and concern for us and in our everyday lives. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray and we give our thanks and say our amens. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. You all rock. Thank you so much. Good <laughs> night, everybody. Great. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night. Good night everybody. See you good Sunday. You. Bye, guys. Bye. Good night, Chris. Bye. Good seeing you. Bye. You're still there. Bye. 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 See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Good night, Jerry. Good night, Jordana. And good night, Linda. Good night, Dave. Good night. See you guys this weekend. Okay, see you guys this weekend. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.